thinking to Nietzsche. Uh, you remember that last time um, I was underscoring his voluntaristic view of human nature. Um, the influence of people like Schopenhauer become pretty evident in his discussion of the strong-willed and the weak-willed, uh, the Dionysian and the Apollonian, and his view that all of our values are ultimately uh, traceable to this will to power that runs through everything, uh, so that our non-egoistic values uh, simply a revenge turned inwards against ourselves, and so forth. Then, as well, we um, uh, were talking about his naturalism because he finds a biological basis to all of this. A biological basis in the sense that uh, while he thinks as an evolutionary naturalist, uh, his evolutionary theory is not that of Darwinian natural selection. That is far too gradual a kind of process. And all it would produce is weak-willed conformists adjusting to an environment rather than overcoming it. His biology is rather biological vitalism. Uh, that is to say that life is a creative force that pervades all of organic existence. Analogous in some ways, if you like, to what you read about Bergson in the chapter on Whitehead and Bergson, who sees in all of nature a static as well as a dynamic or creative um, aspect, tendency, which comes out in two different kinds of human thought, the analytic and the creative, intuitive. Um, don't write uh, about two sides of a brain, that's not the kind of biology they're talking about. Uh, biological vitalism, rather. Now, this um, biological vitalism is plainly, along with the voluntarism, going to affect whatever he says about human knowledge, human thought, epistemology. And in order to pick up on that in particular, which nowadays I suspect is the most influential part of Nietzsche, uh, because it feeds into postmodernism. Uh, in order to pick up on that, would you turn in the anthology to page 323? 323. And you'll be um, bemused by the first paragraph, even though um, it's the second paragraph I'm after. Um, the first paragraph will help you to get the continuity, indeed. Says he, um, after Buddha was dead, uh, people showed his shadow for centuries afterwards in a cave, an immense frightful shadow. God is dead. But as the human race is constituted, there will perhaps be caves for millenniums yet in which people will show his shadow. And we have still to overcome his shadow. Well, this is his satirical way, you see, of saying, as he does in other contexts, uh, God is dead, but you must become the meaning of the earth. You should be as God, you see. Well, um, 109, there on 323, um, says what this um, new superhuman needs to guard against 
if this is going to be. Uh, let us be on our guard against thinking that the world is a living being. It raises all sorts of questions and says, that disgusts me. Let, and then, uh, eight lines down, let's now be on our guard against believing that the universe is a machine. It's assuredly not constructed with a view to one end. We invest it with far too high an honor with the world mach word machine. Let's be on our guard against supposing that anything so methodical as the cyclic motions of the neighboring stars obtained generally and throughout the universe. Um, and the bottom line, the general character of the world, on the other hand, is to all eternity chaos. Not by the absence of necessity, but in the sense of the absence of order, structure, form, beauty, wisdom, whatever else our aesthetic humanities are called. And then on 324, about halfway through that first paragraph, let's be on our guard against saying there are laws of nature. There are only necessities. There's no one who commands, obeys, transgresses. When you know there's no design, you know also there's no chance. For it's only where there is a world of design that word chance has a meaning. Let's be on our guard against saying that death is contrary to life. A living being is only a species of a dead being, a very rare species. Yes, those are the weak will to just uh, a living death. Let's be on our guard against thinking that the world eternally creates the new. There's no eternally enduring substances. Matter is just another error, as the god of the Eleatics. Now, um, look back over that, and you notice that what he is doing is, and I use the word advisedly, deconstructing every known theory about the universe. You see? Here are these attempts at rational explanation, none of which work. That seems to be his point. You see? So you might just as well say, let's be on our guard against thinking. Period. You see? And I take it that's his main point. Let's be on our guard against thinking. And if you turn later on to 340, now take it back, 3, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see, what was the one I was after? That was what, 323? 333, I think it is, that I'm after. No, 326 first, I beg your pardon, 326. Um, section 111, on the origin of the logical. Where has logic originated in men's heads? Undoubtedly out of the illogical. Yes, this creative impulse that's unpredictable, irrational, so forth. The domain of which must originally have been immense. And towards the bottom of the page, no living being would have been preserved unless the contrary inclination to affirm rather than suspend judgment, to mistake rather than wait, to assent rather than deny, to side rather than be in the right, unless that had been cultivated with extraordinary assiduity. The course of logical thought and reasoning in our modern brain corresponds to a process and struggle of impulses, which singly and in themselves are all illogical and unjust. We usually experience only the result of the struggle. So rapidly and secretly does this primitive mechanism now operate in us. Now, you, you remember that in people like um, uh, Hobbes and Spinoza, determinists, there was the notion that the process of reasoning is often just the alternation of alternative emotions alternative impulses of some sort. Now here this is, you see, in, um, um, in, in Nietzsche. 
with the difference that instead of one being just um, weighing heavier than the other, and so the decision is made this way, here it's an, it's an arbitrary creative force which simply affirms one over against the other. And um, accordingly, um, uh, the whole matter of rationality is ultimately an illogical process. Uh, no ground to it. And then on 333, 333, um, uh, the paragraph 4, the falseness of an opinion is not for us an objection. Now, it's here, perhaps, that our new language sounds most strangely. The question is, how far an opinion is life-furthering, life-preserving, species-preserving, perhaps species-rearing, and were fundamentally inclined to make the falsest opinions, to maintain that the falsest opinions are the most indispensable to us. That without a recognition of logical fictions, without comparison of reality to the purely imagined world, without a constant counterfeiting of the world, man couldn't live. The renunciation of false opinions would be a renunciation of life, a negation of life. To recognize untruth as a condition of life philosophy which ventures to do so has thereby placed itself beyond good and evil. Uh, so that the quest for truth is not an issue. That's not the point. He has a purely instrumental value to the theories and beliefs we come up with. We create them for our own purposes an expression of the will to power. And so on the next page, 344, you get um, some of his rather typical satire addressed to some of your favorite people. Uh, so that half a dozen lines down on 344, he talks of the spectacle of the tartuffery of old Kant, equally stiff and decent with which he entices us into the dialectic byways, byways that lead to his categorical imperative. Makes us fastidious ones smile, we who find no small amusement in spying out the subtle tricks of old moralists and ethical preachers. You see. Then, he says, or still more so, the hocus-pocus in mathematical form, by means of which Spinoza has, as it were, clad his philosophy in male and mask. You know, and how can you assault Spinoza with his rigid logic? So he's uh, taking this uh, view of human knowledge, of truth claims, and applying it to those 18th century Enlightenment types completely. And finally, on page 366, where he's talking of moral knowledge, moral knowledge, uh, you have uh, this paragraph. Um, my demand upon the philosopher is known that he take his stand beyond good and evil. That's the title of one of Nietzsche's books from which this is taken. Beyond good and evil and leave the illusion of moral judgment beneath himself. Moral judgment is illusory. This demand follows from an insight that I was the first to formulate. Uh, he's not afraid of egoism, you see. Any rejection of egoism would simply be an attack on himself. Keep that in mind. He's a thoroughgoing egoist. Uh, but the first to formulate this, there are altogether no moral facts. Moral judgments agree with religious ones in believing in realities that are no realities. 
Morality is merely an interpretation of certain phenomena, more precisely a misinterpretation. Moral judgments, like religious ones, belong to a stage of ignorance at which the very concept of the real and the distinction between what is real and imaginary are still lacking. Thus, truth, at this stage, designates all sorts of things which today we call imaginings. Moral judgments are therefore never to be taken literally. They always contain mere absurdity. Semiotically, they remain invaluable. Uh, semiotically, that is to say, they are a sign of something. They reveal, at least for those who know, the most valuable realities of cultures and inwardnesses which did not know enough to understand themselves. So we think our values are objectively real in some way. For those who understand, realize it's uh, simply the wishful thing. Plain language, mere symptomatology. One must know what it's all about to be able to profit from it. Okay, so um, no such thing as truth, uh, no objective moral qualities, no basis in reality for moral knowledge, no basis for any kind of knowledge. Now you see why I write on the board Nietzsche, parenthesis, uh, and postmodernism? Because I suspect that in the radical postmodernism of our day, um, it's uh, Nietzsche who's the most single influential force. That is to say, the postmodernism that has uh, turned fr be from uh, more modest epistemologies still want to make truth claims, but more modestly so. Um, the radical postmodernism of today has turned from that, from talking about truth altogether, to essentially power politics. You see. And the politicization of the university, which you read about in the press these days, is simply in the Nietzschean will to power of certain inter interest groups. You see. Um, turning itself uh, inside out in order to um, assert that sort of thing. So we create our own truth by virtue of the utility that we force upon those who oppose it. Politicization. Okay, does that, uh, does that make sense? You see where he's coming from? I should say where he's going to. Nature. Okay. Um, he says the same sort of thing in other places. Um, Let's see, uh, yeah, here's one. Uh, behind logic stand value judgments, or to speak more plainly, physiological demands for preserving a certain kind of life. You see, all your arguments prove is something about why you find it necessary to do that at all. And uh, he speaks of positivism with its objective empirical data as a democratic self-glorification of the free intellect. Democratic because anybody can gain empirical data. You see. And skepticism <coughs> as a vague physiological quality which in common language is called nervous weakness. A sickness that lacks decisiveness lacks the will the truth. You see? If you don't have the will to power to assert something is true, um, you're weak-willed. Nervous weakness. That's sick. Well, um, and uh, if on the other hand you say to Nietzsche, well, is all this that you're telling us true? You see, I remember asking that in a graduate school course one time, uh, to which the professor responded, ah, oh, Nietzsche would just have a good belly laugh at that. 
And in fact, I find um, in one of his write, one of his books, he says, um, one repays a teacher badly if one remains nothing but a pupil. I bid you lose me and find yourselves, and only when you've denied me will I return to you. Get the point? The one thing Nietzsche wanted to insist is that nothing is true, not even what I'm telling you, not even that. Now, uh, you know, that um, obviously poses the old um, uh, liar uh, dilemma uh, in, from antiquity when um, a certain Cretan says, all Cretans are liars. Now, if a Cretan tells you all Cretans are liars, is he telling the truth? If he's telling the truth, he's telling falsehood. If all Cretans are liars, then he's a liar. But if he's telling you a falsehood, then he's not telling you the truth that all Cretans are liars. And it's not true that Cretans are liars. You see, and you've got that dilemma. Well, similarly, Nietzsche, you don't know what he means. Beyond repudiating the quest for any kind of knowledge, truth. And um, he uh, is particularly emphatic about that when it comes to ethics and religion. I think that's particularly plain. Okay. Well, I said that he deconstructs various theories about the universe because, of course, deconstructionism is um, post-modernism in literary interpretation. <coughs> the interpretation of anything. Okay. Um, do you want to comment at all about Nietzsche, Kierkegaard? Uh, yeah. Jess. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Are you referring to actual um, living organisms or are you referring to a social organism? And if so, isn't it by their adaptation that they overcome their. Uh, um, yeah, keep in mind that um, Nietzsche's underlying thesis, and don't ask me if he thinks it's true, he thinks it's useful at least. You see. His underlying thesis is about the will to power. And it's biologically rooted. This is his useful thesis. Now, in that case, what um, drives the evolutionary process is not the desire for some conformity. You see. It's not the desire for harmony and resolving all of the adjustment problems. What drives it is, if you like, red tooth, bloody claw, we shall overcome. You see, so not Darwinism, but rather this vitalistic, what in Bergson is called creative evolution, sudden outbursts of novelty that are unpredictable in terms of all the mechanisms. Okay. That biological vitalism was um, oh, popular through the 19th century until about 1940, 1950. Um, the um, uh, gradual development of biochemistry and the recognition of uh, oh, the, uh, what is it, the Watson Crick uh, material and so forth about um, DNA and such like, um, that so um, outdated vitalism, you'll see, that we no longer viewed life as itself a creative force distinct from the material elements on which it works. 
but rather life as a function of certain highly complex biochemical compounds. Different view. So vitalism is not very popular now. Oh, the emotivism in his ethic. Yeah, I should have linked that up. That last um, thing, there are no moral facts. That is to say, there is no truth about right or wrong, virtue and vice. Uh, there, there are no objective moral facts at all that can be known. Well, what then are moral judgments? Um, expressions of emotion, of will to power or weak-willedness, as the case may be. Yeah. Uh, what are we doing when we approve of something or disapprove of something? You see, we're, we're asserting emotion about that. So you get this emotivist interpretation of ethic, uh, which is paralleled, of course, in positivism, as we'll be finding out in the Anglo-American tradition. Um, it's not simply a, a subjectivist ethic. Ethical subjectivism is the view that when I say something is right and wrong, I'm talking about my subjective attitudes. No, for Nietzsche, you're not talking about your attitudes. You're just venting them, putting them to work. That's something different. Okay, um, yeah. Um, Rorty, no. Yeah, Rorty draws on a number of sources of whom Nietzsche is one. Dewey is another. Um, Wittgenstein is another. Uh, so there's a whole potpourri of things. Does Rorty see Nietzsche as making truth claims? I don't think so, but I'd want to go back and check Rorty on that. Uh, okay, now I suppose that an inverted Platonism would be to the effect that theory is down here, or better still, ideology is down here. Would that be it? And um, factual assertions are up here. So that in that sense, the factual assertions we make are driven by our ideologies. Okay, now you see, I think that would be um, sort of Nietzschean if you're willing to say that the ideologies are basically expressions of will to power, emotion in that sense. Yeah, and that perhaps is helpful because it helps you to see that there are similarities between Nietzsche, Freud, and Marx. Um, do you get that? Uh, you, you know this much about Nietzsche. You, you know something about Freud that he talks of the subconscious, which um, asserts itself in all sorts of ways in our thinking as well as our acting. You see. Um, the role of the Oedipus complex in Freud. His book, Moses and Monotheism, in which uh, belief in God is the projection of an Oedipus complex. You see? Um, that is to say that um, the, uh, the substructure here is the um, emotional life. That's right. Um, Marx. Yeah, there the, uh, the substructure is the um, material conditions of existence and the alienation that that creates. And because of the conditions of alienation from one's own labor, 
from one's own self, and so forth, you have again a, uh, if you like, a non-rational substructure to the, uh, uh, the theories that you develop and the social structures that you build, you see. And if you've read the Communist Manifesto, uh, you find the assertion that, um, uh, that all our moral standards are simply uh, expressions of the class conflict. So, so you, you have this sort of thing in these three, and uh, the name of uh, Max Weber, the sociologist, belongs um, along here too. Uh, because um, while Weber talks a great deal of values, uh, they seem to be relative, the projection of ideologies. Yes, now, um, you referred to, Roy to Rorty, uh, but another writer who picks up on this very significantly is uh, Alan Bloom. Um, trying to pull out of my mind the title of Bloom's book, um, The Closing of the American Mind. Uh, how many of you have read that? Um, I suspect maybe except for the center section in which he deals with these people. At least most people I talk to who've read Bloom haven't read the center section, which is very philosophical. Maybe you have. I hope so. But um, Bloom um, begins that book with the complaint that the contemporary university student talks as if there is no such thing as truth and falsity, right and wrong. Have you heard that before? Well, you've heard it today. <laughs> um, has lost any uh, sense of personal identity and has no world view on which to ground any of those things. You see. Now that's his complaint. Alan Bloom is a uh, professor of social theory in at um, University of Chicago. Um, uh, well, what, what he does is to trace this situation to these continental thinkers, whom he takes to be the um, source of the problem. I, I guess um, my reaction to it, and I wrote a piece um, responding to it, but my reaction is that that's not the whole story. Um, uh, that at least in uh, the English-speaking world, the influence is, is as much, I think, from the uh, positivist tradition, um, with its assertion that um, we, uh, well, the pragmatist tradition that we um, only have an instrumental view of truth, and meaning, the positivist tradition that all values are just expressions of emotion. You see, that whole thing. So there's a complex that has produced that in society. Um, I think perhaps um, one of the ways in which royalty is different from Bloom is that uh, he does pull in the Anglo-American influences as well as the continental ones. Yeah. But this is part of the postmodernism of the day. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, the, um, the influence of Nietzsche philosophically, uh, think of Nietzsche around 1900, uh, his influence uh, philosophically certainly continued way through the first half of this century. Um, people who sort of echoes what he's doing is uh, Carl Jasper. And uh, most of the literature on existentialism talks about Jaspers, 
uh, even though I think by now he's, um, his influence is much diminished, but in the first half of the century quite prominent. Um, Jaspers was not satisfied with what Nietzsche was doing. It seemed to him that, um, that people like Kierkegaard and Nietzsche put too much of a gap between uh, human subjectivity, that is to say this, these depth dimensions of the inner life of which Nietzsche speaks, uh, and Kierkegaard, um, far too much of a gap between those inner dimensions and what he calls the empirical existence which we have as beings in this world. Uh, if you like, there's too much of a gap between the scientific and the existential. And so um, what uh, Jaspers does in a book of his called Reason and Existence, existence being the mean for existential authenticity, uh, what he does is to uh, point out that it shouldn't be either or, uh, but rather both and. And um, he distinguishes um, three dimensions of um, human being. There is our um, empirical existence, what uh, he calls design, literally being there, being there just another object, another entity. There is uh, consciousness as such. And there he's thinking of Kant's emphasis on the transcendental ego, and Descartes' cogito ego sum. There is that inner mental life. Then, in addition, there is uh, spirit, um, the term Geist in the European sense that we got familiar with in Hegel, uh, that uh, has to do with cultural creativity. Um, the third has been stressed by the idealists, the second by the Enlightenment, the third by empirical science. And you don't really have authentic human existence, according to Carl Jaspers, until you um, have these uh, three dimensions integrated appropriately, embraced by virtue of some, uh, some ground of being of which we become aware. Uh, some all-encompassing ground of being, the umgreifender, the term he uses. Um, and uh, what Jaspers um, uh, talks about then is transcending a purely um, uh, impersonal, inauthentic, empirical kind of existence. Uh, transcending simply that enlightenment um, notion of being a conscious, rational being. Um, transcending even the life of the culture. Do you get the Kierkegaardian note in this? Stages on life's way, you see? Transcending all of that in um, an act of uh, faith that begins to sound almost as if it's religious. Um, and the, um, the identity, the nature of that transcendent being, the all-encompassing being, is something we only speak of in symbols and ciphers. Uh, we can't conceptualize it. It's as if in uh, Hegel's phenomenology of mind, uh, the um, triad of art, religion, and philosophy is such that you can have your artistic symbols, 
you can have your religious symbols, but there's no synthesis. That is to say, you can't have the philosophical conceptualization. Um, and so, um, what is involved is an existential uh, kind of attitude uh, rather than a cognitive grasp in the act of faith. Well, uh, Carl Jaspers, uh, interesting person. He, his wife was a Jewess, and um, when I forget which city it was, was um, liberated by the Allies in the invasion of Germany, it was discovered that um, Jaspers and his wife were listed uh, to be deported to the extermination camp the following week. So he just escaped in that way. Um, all right, Nietzsche. Um, yeah, and I think Jaspers is a good critique of Nietzsche. Um, what he's caught is simply one limited aspect of um, human concern. Um, the creativity of the human spirit, that, uh, that third dimension without the others. Um, what I want to do then is to go on to our next um, a particular topic within this business of existentialism, uh, namely to um, try and introduce what is phenomenology in the 20th century. Uh, we um, recognize that the, the term, the method, is rooted in Hegel, all right. But 20th century phenomenology is much more developed, much more complex. Uh, and I think um, uh, even if we're going to simply talk about existentialism, we have to understand phenomenology. The, um, the history of the thing goes um, something like this. That you have uh, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche in the uh, first uh, phase of existentialism in reaction against the Enlightenment. Okay? Kierkegaard and Nietzsche. And you notice that their work is indeed descriptive. It's more like an introspective kind of psychology of self-discovery or something of that sort. Uh, than anything else. Uh, there's no rigorous philosophical method involved. But as you move into the 20th century, you find that that um, influence of Kierkegaard and Nietzsche is combined with the more rigorous phenomenological method that is being developed out of the original Hegelian roots. Um, a phenomenological method that we usually ascribe in its most rigorous form oops, to the um, German philosopher Edmund Husserl Though uh, it also operates um, earlier and parallel to Husserl in a whole variety of other philosophers in the European tradition. This sort of description of the structures of the inner consciousness. So um, that combination then becomes evident in uh, notably Martin Heidegger, who at one time was the graduate research associate working with Husserl. And um, then in his thinking, parted company with Husserl in some regards. And um, by the same token, uh, people like Sartre, So that Sartre, whom you're reading next week, 
uh, represents this uh, more um, philosophically rigorous phenomenological method in an existentialist. Now, um, it's appropriate to call uh, Kierkegaard and Nietzsche existential thinkers, existentialist, yes. It's appropriate to call these two people existentialists, but they're often um, de delineated from the others as uh, phenomenological existentialists by virtue of the phenomenology. Uh, what they use, that is to say, their method is a kind of existential phenomenology, a phenomenology of human existence, of the existential dimensions of human existence. But that's not what Husserl's phenomenology was developed to do. Husserl was more interested in a phenomenology of the transcendental ego. And so his original work is spoken of as transcendental phenomenology to mark it off from existential phenomenology in no sense would you want to talk, call Husserl an existentialist. You flunk if you do that. Yes, yeah, uh, what he's doing is developing a method. Uh, now, um, uh, there are other European writers who um, appear uh, who also, I think, are more influenced by the earlier Husserl. And uh, among them, I'd list the French philosopher Maurice Merleau-Ponty. I'd list the uh, French philosopher Paul Ricoeur, probably the greatest living French philosopher today. Um, he's still alive, uh, retired, um, taught at University of Chicago for half a year, for the last several years. Um, teaching occasionally at the Université de Montréal, uh, but still teaching um, half a year at the Sorbonne. Now I think he's retired. Um, incidentally, he, um, oh, maybe 20 years ago, we had him as the um, keynote speaker for our philosophy conference uh, when he was teaching in Montréal. Um, he's um, a French Protestant in the French Reform tradition. Um, uh, Paul Ricoeur. Now, um, uh, another name uh, influenced by the early Husserl very much is um, uh, Hans Georges Gadamer, uh, who um, is really the, the main figure. That doesn't look very much like Gadamer, does it? Uh, who's um, really the, um, the major figure in the development of what we call phenomenological hermeneutics. Uh, because the kind of hermeneutic um, that talks about subjective grids and influences intruding in the interpretive process you see. To talk about that involves doing a phenomenology of how the subjectivity is at work in the interpretation. And it's Gadamer who has done that par excellence. You see. And uh, that subjectivity is given excessive role in deconstructionists like Paul DeMond. But um, it's Gadamer who really is the key philosophical figure in the development of that modern hermeneutic. Incidentally, for those of you um, oriented to theology, let me say the word hermeneutic is used much more broadly than just in terms of theology. It means interpretation. So it's used in relationship to science, in relationship to the social sciences, yes, in interpreting situations, interpreting human actions, 
you see. It's used in history, it's used in literature, all the rest of it. It's used in terms of reading a philosophical text, and so forth. So um, that. Now, what, um, what we want to do, first of all, is to get clear on the phenomenological method. We'll start on that today. Want to get clear on that. Want to say something about um, what Heidegger does with it. Then more extensively, of course, Sartre, because you're reading Sartre, as the sample of this phenomenological method. And then I want to say something about the hermeneutical tradition, um, and particularly Gadamer. Okay, so that's our agenda through to the end of next week. Now, um, uh, what is phenomenology? Um, which, um, as a philosophical method, dominates European philosophy. Um, in this country, it is dominant in Roman Catholic philosophy. Due, I might say, to almost a cloak and dagger story. The story being this, that um, uh, in the... Uh, early days of World War II, or was it just before, um, uh, word got out to um, Husserl's um, former students, um, he was dead, uh, that the Nazis were going to seize all his writings and destroy them uh, because of his Jewish um, background. So, in the depth of the night, a Catholic priest who was one of these students secreted all of the Husserl papers in the back of his car and raced across the Belgian border to the University of Louvain, a Catholic university at Louvain, and secreted the Husserl archives. Now, University of Louvain had been major Catholic university in Europe, very influential back in 1878. Um, the Pope had issued an encyclical uh, in the light of all of the religious and social and philosophical developments of the 19th century, an encyclical called the Eterni Patris, of the Eternal Father, uh, calling for a return to the philosophical and theological resources of Thomas Aquinas. This marks the beginning of the neo-Thomist movement uh, that has continued into the 20th century. University of Louvain immediately seized initiative and got on the bandwagon and became the center for neo thomist studies in Europe. Cardinal Mercier, French cardinal, located there, um, wrote um, vigorously um, along those lines. Uh, maintaining that Thomism was the Christian philosophy of the day. To this day, incidentally, some Catholic uh, philosophers, uh, if you use the phrase Christian philosophy with them, they'll be thinking of Thomas Aquinas. I remember when the Society of Christian Philosophers was organized some 10 or 12 years ago, we were discussing uh, what the society should be called. Um, the initial proposal was that we call it the Society of Christian Philosophy. Then it became apparent that our Catholic friends in the group thought of Christian philosophy as um, Thomism. And I'd been accustomed to using the term Christian philosophy for a pluralistic tradition of doing philosophy from a Christian perspective, and the ambiguity became evident. So we called it the Society of Christian Philosophers, and uh, that eliminated the ambiguity. Um, but in any case, um, the fact that in 1945, 46, 45, I guess it was, uh, Louvain woke up to find it had the Husserl archives, changed its philosophical identity. And it became the center for phenomenological studies. And Catholics still going there became phenomenologically oriented. Among them, incidentally, was the present Pope, who um, 
going back to Poland, uh, has actually published phenomenological studies of its own. So, um, cloak and dagger story, well, not quite cloak. Yeah, yeah, cloak, but not quite dagger. Uh, okay, on that story. Um, so, the influence there. Um, phenomenology, phenomenology is not a theory, I underscore that again, it's not a system of thought, it's not a philosophical position, it's a method, a project. And um, phenomenological description, as I've said, goes all the way back to Hegel, and informally in people like Jaspers and some of the other existential writers I've mentioned, like Marcel and Buber and so on and so forth. But the method as such was formulated by Husserl, uh, at least the more technical method was formulated by Husserl, who died in 1938. Now, uh, Husserl has three primary concerns. One, is what he takes to be the failure of philosophical naturalism. The failure of philosophical naturalism. Now, he's using naturalism in the sense of purely um, um, scientific explanations of things. So that in terms of trying to find the foundations of logic, Yes, on what grounds do the laws of logic rest? Or the foundations of, math of mathematics, which is much the same thing. Or the foundations of natural science. You see, all of which have presuppositions about human knowledge and truth. Uh, in trying to provide those uh, foundations for math, natural science, logic, all the naturalist has done is to say they're all due to non-rational processes. Psychological explanations in terms of certain psychological processes which give rise to identifying this, that and the other. If you like, Nietzsche is giving a psychological explanation. Yes, he? Freud is. Or historical explanations. This is the way it happened historically or sociological explanations, cultural influences. So Husserl is, critic is criticizing psychologism, historicism, sociologism, scientism. Now get the isms there. The claim that everything can be explained through those scientific methods including the foundations of logic, mathematics, science, all human learning. Now, um, uh, that's what Husserl was opposed to. He wants more solid foundations so that, uh, so that logic, mathematics, philosophy, can really be founded on unquestionable premises. In other words, he wants a new foundationalism. He wants a new foundationalism. And his idea is that the phenomenological method can get us back to those foundations in the very structure of human nature, the structure of consciousness. Uh, incidentally, um, last year we had uh, Dallas Willard from um, U University of Southern California speaking. Did any of you hear him? He gave a series of lectures against postmodernism, against the anti-realism of the day. Now, Willard is um, a Husserl specialist, and uh, his argument was drawing on phenomenological method in order to oppose the postmodernism and anti-realism of the day. In other words, trying to say that phenomenological description can open up a sufficient understanding of certain structures of the consciousness as to avoid the skepticism, the relativism, 
uh, that is involved in that anti-realistic view. I'll come back to that in a little while. Uh, the second concern which uh, he has about naturalism is um, that it perpetuates the subject-object dichotomy. S perpetuates the subject-object dichotomy because it wants to talk simply about objective matters, historical causes, objectifying psychological pr processes, sociological processes. It's only interested in objectivist explanations that exclude the role of human subjecthood. There is therefore a loss of the creativity of the constructive contribution of the human spirit. That is to say, the naturalist has bypassed uh, the Kantian Copernican revolution. So what Husserl wants is a new foundationalism that acknowledges Kant's Copernican revolution. It must be a science of the creative, constructive activities of the human spirit in organizing experience. <coughs> yes, sir. And that is why it has to be a phenomenology of the transcendental ego. Yes, sir. That ego that transcends all of the particulars of concrete experience. That ego which is the, in Kant, uh, the, the, the thing that has the forms and the categories all nicely schematized into the transcend, in a transcendental unity of apperception. Okay, now he wants to take a much closer look at that sort of thing. Well, next time we'll um, try and say how he does it.